Okay. Uh, so this talk is uh, really about the theme and the context of the exhibition. And uh, I'm going to ask the artists that will be presenting to kind of tell their own stories of how they come about the making of their own works and where that comes from. And also I'm going to be... Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of artists here that should be also... What was it? Alexio Achilios and Igor Chemokinenko. Did I say that right? I have no idea. <laughs> well, he's your collaborator. So, uh, for your work. And there's uh, people that can't be he here. Anna Dimitriou, who did that dress, and the, the necklace, which are poisonous. Uh, Marinos Kurtz Michalis. That's uh, close. He, Alice, sorry. Simon Stein and H. Uh, Kipros Kiprianu. Good. Uh, Joanna Moll Cedric Parizon. Silent T. Uh, Guido Segni and AOS with Salvatore Iconesi and Oriana Pasico. And so they're the ones that can't be here. And I'll let the artists introduce themselves as they come on. And it's a, it's a good collection because a lot of the artists that I, I like are kind of exploring not just the art world, which I find quite boring. Uh, they're exploring the world through their art. So they're asking questions through their art. And it's not just uh, object for the sake of being an object. It's, it's the, the, they're asking questions through their art practice, which is much more interesting for me. Uh, but for someone else, it doesn't matter. But for me, that's what it means. And uh, so, as you can see, with a, we're kind of like a kind of interesting group because we kind of see, see ourselves as a kind of group that's run on networks, infrastructures, and platforms. Uh, we kind of started as a grassroots group uh, in 96 and uh, we, we're quite good at getting funding because we work very hard and we don't get as much fun you never get as much funding as you want uh, but we're in a park in London with over 180 different languages and so it's real ley line of culture and uh, and we work with refugees we work with all kinds of people we're not like a traditional gallery that's very much top down, we work from the bottom up. So we even have refugees who curate exhibitions themselves. Uh, this, that's, the, that's one gallery, as you can see, that's our gallery in London. It's so expensive to have spaces now, that this used to be a toilet. <laughs> and when we first, uh, when we first uh, it was given to us by Bristol Council, and uh, when we first used to close at night at winters, uh, it used to be a very popular cottaging den where lots of interesting men used to come along and make love with each other. Yeah. And we used to bump, out, bump into them and step over them, which is quite fun, but strange. And, uh, but there's groups we work with. We like working with... We're not really an institution, we're a non-institution. And, uh, and so... It's worth saying uh, there's kind of like we're an assemblage of things, so we're online, we work with, uh, in the park, we've got a common space which I can't show just now, and these are kind of some of the partners we work with, and Dean is one of them, and they're kind of small scale groups that are uh, 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 exploring the world through their identities uh, by having interesting exhibitions, and so, and this is kind of just one of a event. That this event was a kind of uh, a Daiwo event, and the Daiwo event is when we invent the public to curate the shows themselves. So they collectively decide what exhibitions going to come in, and then they kind of do a co-curation to break down the hierarchy of curation. And so a lot of our stuff is kind of deliberately. All, it's all based around anti-patriarch, anti-anti-propriety, and sharing knowledge, because I've come from a working class background, so I think it's, and some of the people 
in that park that lived there come from working class, so we, we're really keen not to go to the posse galleries because they're not as interesting, but the people in the park are really interesting. And so it adds nice flavour to the mix of things. Uh, now to go to Mary Shelley, uh, which is also a very interesting character in our own right, because uh, as you can see, uh, we'll go to her mum, but her mum, mother Mary Wollstonecraft was a, a revolutionary and her dad was a revolutionary and that really inspired her writing about Frankenstein and also her mum died 11 days after she was born um, uh, which is obviously quite sad and uh, she was born in London in 1797 and uh, before then you had the French Revolution which her mum was very much involved in and it kind of inspired that family to be asking questions about hierarchy and, uh, and Mary Shelley's kind of critique of the world was very much not just challenging society but she was challenging the misogyny of revolution as well. So it wasn't just about oh we want a revolution, it was actually saying that actually why is it always blokes, guys that are creating these revolutions and they're always the ones that win them or lose them and the women either get shot or raped or attacked and all that nonsense. And uh, obviously uh, she was influenced by the, the, the kind of myth of Prometheus, which is a really interesting uh, story in its own right or fable even. And so Greek mythology for me was possibly mean and forethought, which could be seen as warning, uh, is a titan culture hero and trickster figure who is credited with the creation of man from clay, who defies the gods by stealing fire and handing it over to humanity uh, as a gift. Uh, and that they call that civilization. So for me, he's known for his intelligence and as a champion of humankind. And he was actually punished for, for championing humankind and giving them technology, which fire is technology, and, uh, and arts and science. And I can get in more detail, but the talk's not long enough to go into the, more sp the, the specifics. Uh, and then, basically, I've got some more notes here, but basically he was, uh, as a punishment, he was chained to a rock. And... So the punishment of Prometheus as a consequence of his theft is a major theme of his and he is a popular subject of both ancient and modern culture. Uh, Zeus, king of the Olympian gods, sentenced the titan to eternal torment for his transgression. The immortal was bound to a rock and where each day an eagle, the emblem of Zeus, was sent to eat Prometheus, his liver, uh, which would then grow back overnight to be eaten again the next day. That was his punishment. So there's a kind of real... Uh, it's the, the, the thing is, is that if you try to do good, you get punished. That's, the, that's basically quite Catholic. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, the original uh, book of... Mary Wollstonecraft, which is uh, Mary Shelley's mother. And I don't want to read the whole text out because it'll get not that exciting. Okay, it, and it won't get exciting, but the important things that I find interesting about uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is that obviously she was fighting for women's rights, but she was also arguing at the most kind of, with the most powerful intellectual men at that time, which is Rousseau, who was key in the revolution in France, but also Thomas Paine, who, and she went over to France uh, with Rousseau, uh, no, with Thomas Paine, and obviously Thomas Paine was locked up and nearly killed, and she somehow escaped, but she risked her life, like people in Rojava right now, or the, the Kurdish women, for what she believed and fought on the streets against uh, the, the kind of Russian royalty at the time. So it gives you some idea of what an interesting character she is, that she wasn't just at home like people are on their computers writing the revolution kind of thing and putting it on Twitter. 
uh, she actually wrote the about revolution, which she believes in, and she actually went to one. And, and that's very brave as a woman, you know, you, you, you believe in what you're fighting for. And so she's a very interesting character. She, she lives what she writes about, and that's very rare in academia, uh, I must say, where people don't act, you get some really interesting intellectual conceptual arguments, especially Marxism and anarchism and whatever, but do they live what they say? And that's the question here. And that's so after that, you get really interesting people like Byron and Ada Lovelace and these other characters that are very influenced, say, from Mary Shelley and worked with Mary Shelley. They're, they live what they believe. And that's interesting. And so I, I don't know if it's easier to live then or harder. And so this is uh, uh, Mary Shelley's dad and husband of Mary Wollstonecraft. And he was the, he was the first really character that wrote about anarchism. And he was quite a, a, a popular writer. And as you can see, his most famous work is a, uh, an inquiry concerning political justice, an attack on political institutions, and the things, uh, and his th other thing was The Adventures of Caleb Williams, uh, an early mystery novel which attacks aristocratic privilege. So very powerful critiques about uh, the kind of hegemony and the conformity around that time. And uh, very important because loads of people are arguing about all this stuff and the difference between France and uh, England was that uh, the, the difference, uh, the thing is that England at that time, or just before that time, they only just got allowed to vote. As in the aristocratic people were the only people that were allowed to vote. So if you owned property, for instance, which only rich people at that time, well, you weren't allowed to vote. That was it. And so, and so we had a much more aristocratic tradition than France. And uh, so that's a really interesting uh, kind of uh, issue that's going on around that time. And it took another revolution in London, which wasn't a revolution, but it was a massive riot, like a bit like poll tax, called the Gordon Riots, which is in 1718, uh, uh, nine years before the Russian Revolution, which people think informed, not the Russian, the French Revolution. And, uh, and that was when the uh, kind of the Scottish and the Irish and the poor of London got together and with a guy called uh, Gordon uh, and he was like a Lord Gordon and it was called the Gordon Riots and it was a really poignant time when they actually started to get people to vote after that. So, and so, and then, so then they weren't even letting poor men vote, let alone women anyway. And so things started to happen which was really interesting times. And then you had, well, her lover boy, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. He got thrown out of Cambridge and, uh, uh, as an anarchist and, uh, by being too rude. And they were very posh there, so that's going to happen. And uh, he was always skint and always uh, borrowing and stealing money of everyone, but actually he wrote some really good stuff and she worked with her on some of the context of Frankenstein, and especially Prometheus, which is where he, his uh, ideas were coming from. Now, regarding Frankenstein, so the ideas of what we think of Frankenstein, obviously we know that Dr. Frankenstein is the doctor, then you've got the monster of Frankenstein. So if we think about what that is, what is Frankenstein, and what is the doctor, and what is the monster, and what all that strange mix-up of what was going on there, in a way, the monster is the other. It's, it's the darkness of ourselves. And, uh, and at that time, in, in uh, kind of 19th century literature and 18th century and even before and afterwards, they were asking those questions about... And Oscar Wilde is another character that was asking similar questions in his writing. And this is a really good example, the picture of Dorian Gray, where this guy had his painting of his soul in the room, locked in a loft. And as he did more deeds, like murdering people, that painting would decay. And that would be... And, but he would be, stay young forever, and the painting would get old and decay. 
and because he, he sold his soul to the devil and that's the deal. And uh, so it's very interesting, that kind of uh, moral questions that are being asked by writers around that time. Uh, this exhibition started in Spain in uh, 2016 and Spain in Laval is a massive space like the Tate. Uh, I don't know why they let us have the exhibition, but they did, which is great. And uh, we had more people. There's Mary's work there, which is a different piece, which you can hopefully explain about a bit later. And then there's Artists Open Source, which is Salvatore Iconism, <coughs> which is downstairs there, but we decided to exhibit it differently. And there's all kinds of stuff, and there's Alan's in the background there on the right. And we've got Aboriginal artists showing work there as well. Because the money was more, we were able to get them across to do their own interpretation of Frankenstein and the monster, which is great fun. And we also had them walking around the space on mud and stuff and dirty in it. So it's quite fun, you know, dirty in a nice pure space. And uh, these are the names of the artists that are in the show. And uh, so, so Joanna Moles in this show as well. Uh, obviously, we couldn't include everyone, but we, the show is a touring exhibition that goes to different places. Like we had the show at our gallery in London as well, a smaller version, which is a bit similar to this one. And, and so we had the Walperry artists there, uh, which are the Aboriginal Australian artists. And I'm just going to talk a bit about sort of some of the context of contemporary Frankenstein. And uh, so, as you can see, uh, these are names in this show, but I've started with jellyfish here, because that's going to come up in a minute. Uh, I wrote loads of stuff about kind of postmodernism, uh, feminism, and uh, mutation, cyborgs, and all kinds of stuff. And this is the thing that I wrote Prometheus 2. Point. Frankenstein conquers the world. And just in case you want to read it, and, and there's a really interesting quote by Marx. So nature builds no machines, no locomotives, railways, electric telegraphs, self-acting mules, etc. They are organs of the human brain created by human hands, the power of knowledge objectified, which I found really interesting kind of thing. Interesting artist that's supposed to actually be a gift, for some reason not working now. Uh, which is Shelley Jackson, who wrote in 95, uh, Patchwork Girl, influenced by Mary Shelley. So it's a retelling of the story of Frankenstein. The emphasis is about the appropriation and transformation, and the film and monster is completed, or rather assembled, by Mary Shelley herself. So very much a kind of Haraway, Donna Haraway, when she asks, us, asks women especially to become cyborgs and remake themselves to adapt to the world that they're living in which is a really good critique of getting around the kind of misogyny frameworks that are blocking people in getting on. Uh, this is interesting. We're getting more and more jellyfish that are invading everywhere around the world because of climate change. And uh, just to give you some idea of what that looks like at nuclear power stations. So uh, in July, is, well, basically, <laughs> They're fishing these out, out of uh, nuclear power stations that are connected to uh, the sea because they recycle to cool down the, uh, the reactors. They need to see, but what comes in with the water are all these jellyfish that are eating all the radiation around it. And so you've got this weird mutual new relationship going on where the jellyfish actually like the disasters uh, but as in finding habits to survive around it. And fishermen now catching thousands of jellyfish. They don't want them, but they're filling up the nets with no fish in them. Very so it's very scary stuff that's going on. And if you look at this map, 300 tons of jellyfish damaged intake screens at the uh, desalination plant, cutting its output by 50%. Uh, Japan, 10 ton trawler capsized when the crew tried to haul a net full of uh, numerous jellyfish which can weigh up to 440 pounds each. Uh, invasion code likely brought to the sea via ships back, you know, there's, 
there's a continuation now where actually jellyfish are, are, are kind of like uh, the top of the food chain in the sea and all the other animals are gradually dying out because the sea's been radiated by the sun but also been uh, the, 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 the water is losing its plankton and salt uh, because of uh, climate change and all those big blocks of ice sinking into the water and diluting it. So there's all kinds of reasons why. And this is, so this is a, a mutation that's happening in the world, which is very Frankenstein. This is the book that's kind of, kind of was in relation to the original exhibition, but it still speaks quite strongly to how we deal with climate change and doing exhibitions like this uh, uh, in a way where you're not banging people on the head, where you're dealing with the trouble in a way that's not just about hurting people, uh, but you're asking critical questions at the same time. So this is quite, it's never been clearer than now that we must stay with the trouble, and that's that stay with climate change, adapt to it and actively seek possibilities for recuperation, even as we're anxiously learning the great depths of the trouble we face. Uh, this is what concerns with exactly that, with teasing out effective methodologies for moving forward in, a contemporary, uh, in contemporary times through invention, collaboration, exploration, play, and a willingness to take on the risky business of following the threads where they lead. And it's... Uh, I could say more about this book, but I think people should read it and just explore it and find their own kind of connection with it on their own terms. But for me, what's interesting about it is like, and I'm just going to rewind to a post I saw last week where Steve Bannon, who obviously fun, uh, got loads of money to, get, to fund Brexit with really dodgy people, hedge funders, and... Uh, and he did a warning, and it's all going wrong now. It's going wrong for Trump, it's going wrong for Bannon. It's all changing now, and it's because of the women. Greta Thunberg, all these women now are fighting back. And Bannon is saying, we're in danger now. The patriarch is now going to be challenged by women. And that's what's going to happen. And Haraway is part of that army of women, as some of the women in here, where the men are now just going to have to suck it and see, if I can use a better term, and, uh, and actually back down and see what the women can offer because they are coming out with solutions and they're, they're braver. And Mary Shelley is part of that as well. 200 years ago, she started that ball rolling and that's where we are now. Thank you.